Alrighty guys, welcome back to the shop. Today we're going to be making a worn cliff style knife. Uh, it looks very similar to one of the boat knives I've made in the past. And it has that distinctive flat edge with a drooping tip there. So we're going to be making this knife and we're also going to be making a leather sheath at the end. First thing I do is I cut out my template and glue it onto a piece of 1084 steel. I drilled a 3 16 of an inch hole where my sharpening choil will go uh, so that I can cut to that hole and not have to file it in or mill it in. I've done it a few different ways here. They all work. Uh, the file, sometimes you can have problems keeping everything nice and square. The mill, the setup takes a while to mill it in and the drill seemed to work pretty good. I'm getting my spine up to a 220 grit finish here. I like getting the spine of the knife to a fairly high finish before I heat treat and temper. It just makes my life easier down the road after the heat treating process to not have to go back and get out large 60 grit scratches. So I'll be using a checkering file to put in some jimping. And what you saw me do before this was cleaning up that sharpening choil that I drilled in uh, just with a drill, a file, and some sandpaper. So I'll be marking off where I'll put my holes. I'll have two number 13 holes for my Corby fasteners and then a center eighth of an inch hole for a straight pin. That center pin is more decorative than anything. You can see that I'm using some cutting fluid here just to extend the life of my bits. I buy my twist bits in bulk, mostly from either eBay or Amazon in sets of 10, uh, just because I, I go through a lot of the same size bits, especially the number 13s, the quarter inches, and the eighth of an inch bits. To get the forge going, I put my muffle pipe in there and we start heating the blade up. What I don't show here is that I did two normalizing cycles on this blade uh, before the quench here in Parks 50. Before the blade is allowed to cool, I will put it into my straightening plates and clamp down. This ensures the blade cools flat. We'll then get it clamped up between two pieces of angle iron for our tempering process. I'll be running two tempering cycles at around 211 degrees Celsius for two hours a piece. In between cycles, you can cool it to room temperature quickly in water and then put it back in for your second cycle. This does not negatively affect any of the properties of the blade. After the heat treating process, I get all of the spine and the edge areas back to a 220 grit finish. I do this before I surface grind the flats. I'm spending some extra time here making sure that I get my sharpening choil nice and clean and then the small little flat section on the Ricasso of this blade nice and clean as well. I'll be taking the surface finish on the sides of the blade or the flats of the blade up to a 400 cork grit finish. I start with a 220 grit belt, then I move to a 360 grit uh, gator belt. And finally after that I'll move to the 400 grit cork belt that has been loaded with green rouge. These cork belts are pretty cool. They can be slightly grabby at times, but they uh, require a little bit of a breaking process, uh, meaning that you buy a brand new belt, you load it up uh, with the compound, and then you would push a bar of steel into it for an extended period of time, maybe 10 or 15 minutes, to knock down the peaks of that cork belt. So this is the final result. Uh, so it's nice blade finish there to get started grinding our bevels. I put a little bit of marking fluid on the edge and then I use my height scribe here to mark my center line. This will be the target that we'll be grinding our edge to. When you start grinding, you want to come into the belt at a very aggressive angle, somewhere around 45 degrees and you want to be using an older belt in order to preserve the abrasives on your new belts just because this sharp edge can knock a lot of that abrasive off. So you'll come in at an aggressive angle and you'll get both sides down to that center line and then you'll slowly start working that bevel back. What you may have just seen me do is also apply a little bit of WD-40 
onto the bevel that I'm not currently grinding. I'll be dunking this blade into water to keep it cool the whole time, and I don't want any rust accumulating. Uh, it's probably not a big deal, but I just do that uh, for peace of mind. So I get it up to a 60 grit finish, and then we move on to the J-Flex belts. I like the J-Flex belts because you can uh, run them off the side of your platen and allows you to get into the plunge area with a nice smooth radius. So I start off with a 120 grit J-Flex, and then I move to a 220 grit J-Flex, and I actually hit it with a scotch Bright belt after that. The etching process for this blade was as follows. I hit it with 12 one second cycles at DC and then three one second cycles at AC power to make sure it's nice and dark. Then I went back to the belt sander and did two or three more passes with the scotch Bright belt to clean it all up. Before we are going to etch this blade, I like to clean it with soap and water, make sure it's nice and clean and then we'll get it into the etchant. Every two minutes or so, I'll take it out and scrub it down with a piece of steel wool uh, and then put it back in. And I'll do this probably for about 10 minutes. Using this DIY tumbler here uh, in connection with my 2x72 belt sander, we will tumble this blade in rocks for about 15 minutes. There's nothing special about the rocks that I'm using. If you have access to tumbling media, that's ceramic tumbling media. I'm sure that may work better or just as good, but the rocks seem to do a good job. I'll be using two pieces of orange and black G10. They were fairly flat already, but I just went and made sure that they're super flat. And we will be drilling our holes through our blade and into this G10. You know, the workshop can be a fairly precarious place at times. And my Panasonic G7 camera found that out quickly today. I was going to cut the profile of this knife scale and I tipped over the tripod and my camera went for a ride. Luckily, uh, nothing was broken there and we were able to get back to business. So we'll roughly cut out these handles on the bandsaw and then head over to the belt sander to sure everything up close to the line. I've been getting closer and closer to my scribed lines just to reduce the amount of sanding I have to do post glue up. I built this little angle jig for my last project, my Damascus knife, which had bevels along the entire handle scale, but it also works extremely well for beveling the front of your handle scales. As a side note here, I really like working with G10. I feel like it grinds nice and easy compared to some other handle material, and you also don't get any blow through uh, with your drill bits when you're drilling through it. Well, like all handle materials, you don't want to breathe this stuff in. It's terrible for you. Uh, but other than that, I really like the way it looks and I like the way it grinds. I guess another negative could be that it's a little bit heavy, but other than those uh, few negatives, it's a pretty robust handle material. So using my counter bore from Pops Knife Supply, I go in about 3 16 of an inch into both handle scales in each one of those holes. And that gives me a target of a Corby fastener that has a head-to-head -head distance of about 0.28 inches. So they come stock at about 0 0.3, 0 0.34, and we need to modify the length of the Corby fasteners to fit our project. So I normally go a little bit less than what I calculate, uh, so I'm getting these to about a 0.27, and then we're going to take down our eighth of an inch center pin so we have a nice snug fit in our center hole. Using some G-Flex epoxy, we get it nice and mixed up. I think I normally mix up about 1.6 grams of each, of, of each, uh, each container there, and that's more than enough to glue up a knife. I put a little bit of epoxy into the Corby holes first, coat the flat of the scale, put the Corby fasteners in, do that on both scales, and then put the epoxy onto the knife itself, making sure to fill up all of the epoxy holes that we put in there in the tang. Get my Corby fastener started, and then pop that eighth of an inch pin in there before tightening it down. I, I like to have that eighth of an inch pin in there first, just so that when I'm squeezing the scales with the Corby fasteners, uh, that epoxy can go all around that pin and all the voids inside of the handle. So our epoxy was able to dry for about 24 hours here. Uh, we cut off the heads of the Corby fasteners and the pin, and then flattened everything on the belt sander with a 60 grit 
aluminum oxide belt. Once I get the sides flattened and the handle scales ground down to the tang, I will be tapering this knife from the front to the back a little bit, just because these scales are a little thicker than I wanted for this knife. They're around uh, 0 0.29, 0 0.28 thickness each, so I want to thin them down towards the front of the knife. So here I'm still getting everything down to the spine. I get all that up to a 220 grit finish. And then back to the 60 grit belt here, you can see that I'm putting some aggressive pressure towards the front of the handle scales. I get a nice constant line from the front to the back as an angle. And then I will start rotating the knife so that I can round it uh, along the length axis of the knife. Once I have a nice radius there, I will use my new slack belt attachment. I kind of threw this thing together and it's been working okay. It's a little more flimsy than I would like it to be. I used a quarter inch piece of plate where I really should have used a larger piece for that uh, arm there. But you know, it's getting the job done. Uh, I don't think it's gonna break on me. So I'll be keep using it and I will report back on how it does. But I use the slack belt portion here with a scalloped one inch belt and I get into all the nooks and crannies and round everything over. So this is what it looks like off the grinder uh, with a 220 grit one inch scalloped belt. I move on to the hand sanding. We'll start with a 320 grit paper, making sure not to dome over these pens. You know, we use a hard backing on the sandpaper uh, during most of the hand sanding in order to keep those pins from doming over. Uh, just because if you don't do that, you'll take away the G10 faster than the metal on the pins and you'll have a dome shaped pin and you'll actually be able to feel those in your hand. So we start with a 320, then we move up to a 600 grit paper and finally to a 1000 grit paper to finish this off. Once the handle is done, we'll sharpen a blade using the wind water cooled sharpening system here. I set my edge angle to about a 19 degree angle there. I ground this edge super thin, so this is gonna be more of a slicer than a chopper for sure, uh, but it came out razor sharp. Hit it with the leather strop that I have a little bit of green compound on, cuts paper and shaves uh, with no problem. So now for all intents and purposes, the knife is done. Uh, so we're going to make a sheath. So I've been learning a lot on the sheath making process. Uh, after the last video, uh, the comment section was excellent. I learned even more. So I took some of those learnings and put them into practice on this blade. So the first thing I did was I laid the blade down on the center line and rolled it over. And then I start drawing the sheath around it on one side. I'm going to have a one inch belt loop there. My belt loop from the center line is about uh, 5 sixteenths of an inch away from the center line. And then I draw a nice gradual curve and then on this one I'm going to have a half inch welt. So you can see I go back and forth a little bit on the outside curvature of the sheath uh, just so I can get that welt at uh, the appropriate distance from the blade. I'll be doing a butterfly sheath design here so I'll have a, a little bit of welt come up on the back end of the spine. So I fold it over, I make some cuts, and then I finish it off with an X-Acto knife in the corners. To transfer it onto the leather, I'll just use a pencil and then get it cut out with uh, an X-Acto knife here. So this leather, like I mentioned in my leather sheath video recently, is Wicked and Craig leather and it is super nice. It is a seven to eight ounce leather and the grain on the back lays really flat, which is uh, definitely a time saver. So the first thing I'll address will be the top. I will make sure that all my edges at the top have been sanded down and burnished. I'm using some quick slick here. A major tip that I got on my first video was that I need to put the quick slick onto the edge before sanding. I thought it was just a burnishing agent, but in, in reality, if you put it on there before sanding it, it makes everything nice and smooth. So I put the quick slick on the edge, I sand it at the 320, and then I put some more quick slick on it, sand it to 600, and then I'll burnish these edges. I also quick slicked and burnished the outside of the belt loop that will be riding against your pants. 
Using a washer, I marked out where my stitch line will be on the belt loop. And then using some pricking irons, I laid out where I will be puncturing the holes. Before folding the blade, I'll take a little bit of material out of the center where the blade will lie. This makes the fold a little bit more natural on the sheath. I'm going to use some contact cement to get the belt loop laid down, and then we'll be putting our maker's mark into the sheath. I case the leather gently with some water, and then using my arbor press, put a little bit of pressure onto this plastic leather stamp, and it came out great. So normally I use a finishing nail turning in my drill press, but this time around I just wanted to puncture these holes by just pressing down with the weight of the drill press and a larger needle and this seemed to work out pretty good. I need to play around with a diff different needle sizes and uh, see what works for me, but this was a little bit of a tighter uh, hole for this one millimeter thread and I like that better. So we get this uh, saddle stitch going all the way around and I back stitched one and a half and then I use a soldering iron to melt the tips. Ideally, I'd have a hole punch here when I was cutting out my pattern, but I wanted to have a radius at the bottom of my butterfly, so I just used a piece of sandpaper wrapped around the file. So we get this welt glued in, hammered down, and then we're going to be folding over this sheath. Now, I don't think I have footage of the fold, but uh, just know that the fold is a precarious scenario and you gotta line up all the edges. So after I got it folded up, I went to the belt sander to smooth up all the edges and get them all nice and flat with each other, all three of those edges. I laid a light groove line down as a target, and then I made a second pass with more pressure. Uh, this groover can get away from me sometimes. I didn't want to slip. Using the pricking irons, I set out where I'll be laying my stitches, and then I edged the outside and the back of the sheath. So I went back to my finishing nail method on the three layer section of the sheath. Um, you know, I think I could have used the press method uh, with, with those smaller needles, but it would have been a little more cumbersome to get my needles through during my saddle stitch. But I think I have found a smaller needle that I can actually put in the drill press instead of a finishing nail. Uh, that's going to be the best of both worlds. So stay tuned. You'll see that on the next one. So you can see there I started off in the second hole, backstitched through the first hole, and I just feel like that's a little stronger right there in that spot. There's a lot of force on that spot of the sheath and I wanted to make sure it was nice and tough. So we're using some white one millimeter thread here and some John James needles. As I was working through this project, I really liked the way that this butterfly sheath was turning out and I think I'll do more of this type of design of sheath in the future. I just think it looks cleaner and I like that there's a welt coming around the tip. So you can see I do one back stitch here. Uh, I think I actually do one and a half back stitches. Yeah, one and a half. So once I do my one and a half back stitches, I will cut the thread fairly close to the sheath and then use my soldering iron again to uh, heat up those ends and mushroom them out a little bit. So this is what it looks like before we finish the edge. Using some quick slick and some 320 grit sandpaper, I sand the edge. I end up moving up to a 600 grit sandpaper, trying to keep all my sanding going in one direction. And then I will burnish this edge. Now, before I burnish the edge, I am going to dye it. If I had black dye, I would use that. Uh, I actually have some on order, but I don't have any on hand. So I went with the medium brown dye that I had on hand just to darken up that edge a little bit before I burnish it. Put a little bit of beeswax on the edge and then head over to the power Dremel burnisher here. And this edge came out nice and slick. So the methods that I got uh, by all the users in the comment section, especially from Diomedes Industries, uh, really, really helped me out here. I oiled this guy down with a little bit of Neat's foot oil and put a knife in it. It fits nice. Uh, I'm going to be pressing on it for a little bit here with the with the Neat's foot oil to try to do like a very light molding, uh, but it fits just fine with the friction fit, and this is how it turned out. So as always, I hope you guys really enjoyed this build and maybe got something out of it. 
If you did, hit that like button down below and please consider subscribing to the channel. Until the next time, I'll catch y'all on the flip side.